Okay. Welcome everyone again. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I will add, so I'm, I'm probably one of the few here that was born in Trieste and grew up in Trieste. Um, and my love for the city actually will be apparent throughout my talk a little bit. Um, I was trained as a physicist. I left Trieste as a particle physicist and gradually transformed into a biologist or some mixture. Um, so I'm going to tell you as, as the first lecture of this workshop, and it's really just amazing to see the diversity of, of geography and, and, and um, uh, scientific background here, and a lot of uh, colleagues that inspired me throughout the years are here. So this is really wonderful. I'm going to give you an, an overview of some of the concepts that I think are uh, interesting in thinking about microbial communities with examples from my own work um, and touching upon things that we'll hear about in the next few days. Um, so I'll start by showing this slide that to me represents um, some of the reasons I'm interested and in. I was attracted by microbial communities uh, and two examples of how microbial communities affect human life and uh, we are all very familiar with this. Uh, uh, this represents, um, let's see, oops, um, the effect of microbes on our own health uh, and I like to think of the little people around Gulliver as being um, helpers and I think that's how we think now about most of uh, the human microbiome. Um, the other side, which is perhaps um, less uh, well known, is the fact that microbes affect humans at the planetary scale. And this is a phytoplankton bloom of the coast of France. Uh, and what is just amazing to me is that these little entities can have a huge impact on the metabolism and micro uh, metabolic composition of the biosphere. And in fact, microbes like this one are the ones that gave rise to the oxygen uh, that made multicellular life possible about two billion years ago. So I think it's still very interesting to, in, to, to understand how microbes affect uh, uh, planetary scale metabolism. Now, um, oops. I, as you all know, metabolism and microbial metabolism is a multi-scale problem. So we can think of microbes as, uh, from uh, the perspective of what I'm going to tell you about, as bags of enzymes uh, where each organism has an internal network. And, uh, and it's not clear whether in trying to understand how microbes interact with each other, for example, through cross-feeding or competition or antibiotics fighting, uh, whether we can understand what happens between different microbes by understanding what happens inside them. I think that's one of the big challenges. But one could imagine looking at microbes as entities that are represented by one single variable, looking at uh, lotka volterra type equations that describe each microbe as, as an entity without looking at what happens inside. And at the other extreme, and I'll mention this briefly later, one could think of whether it matters uh, which enzymes, which molecules and networks are present in each organism, or whether one can study a whole community as a big soup of enzymes. Uh, so does compartmentalization matter? So I like to think of these different scales and different problems as really spanning multiple hierarchies and multiple levels of descriptions, and I think this is one of the exciting challenges of studying microbial communities. So let's start with uh, the challenge of trying to figure out whether uh, the network of interactions between microbes can be somehow inferred or understood in terms of the uh, interactions and networks that are present inside each individual organism. Why specifically would we want to do this? There are multiple reasons. These are some of uh, the specific questions we're interested in my group at Boston University. Um, we want to try and, and see whether it's possible to really understand the dynamics of these communities based on the uh, metabolic networks present inside each organism. Can metabolism help explain the stability or instability of microbial communities, uh, the unculturability of many strains, perhaps through metabolic interdependencies, and the diversity of microbial ecosystems? The other side of this is an engineering side. Many people here and in the world are interested in synthetic microbial communities. Can we engineer and can we understand microbial communities well enough to be able to engineer them for specific functions? Uh, for example, shifting the balance between a disease associated microbiome and a healthy one or making communities that can produce something useful like, such as biofuel molecules. 
So when you start thinking about metabolism and modeling metabolism, this is the problem you face. This is the network that you see often, the chart that you see hanging in many labs of all known metabolic reactions across all organisms. And this seems and is indeed a difficult task. And this is where um, a um, famous Italian writer from Trieste helps us. Um, so this is a quote from um, Italo Svevo, one of, um, uh, one of the most famous writers from Trieste. Um, uh, this is a quote from Zeno's Conscience, uh, a, a piece of literature that is famous in Italy and in Trieste in particular as one of the um, key uh, writings in the early 1900. Um, and if you walk around Trieste, you'll see the statue of uh, Svevo. This is in the heart of the old city next to the uh, library and not far from the old port, so it's a beautiful place to visit. Um, so this quote says, um, I'll read just the English version, one cannot expect a chemist to know the world by heart. And I, I can't go into the context of why uh, Zeno was saying this in the, in the novel, but uh, why this is important to us, because indeed we can't hope to keep in mind all the metabolic network, and we can represent this, especially as we try to do quantitative modeling, we can represent this network as a matrix and, and build pipelines from databases such as KEG that includes all known reactions in metabolism through uh, the information content of genomes, so we can see which of these reactions are present in the genome of each individual organism, and we can build a network that is specific for a specific microbe. In this case, this is the metabolic network of E. coli, where each uh, link represents a reaction, each node represents a metabolite. And this counts of the order of 1,500 reactions, approximately 1,000 metabolites, uh, and one can represent this with what is called the stoichiometric matrix, SIJ, representing the number of moles or molecules of molecule I that participate in reaction J. So this makes it possible to do, uh, to represent this complex network into a mathematically tractable form and gives rise to a lot of methods, some of which I'll mention today. So if anybody that uh, has not familiar with this and is interested, there are, there are a lot of these networks available. Uh, for example, uh, through the Department of Energy KBase, a database of reactions, or on this website from Bernard Paulson at UCSD that has uh, tens and now increasingly more hundreds of uh, reconstructed networks for specific organisms for which one can do, uh, try and do detailed modeling. Uh, so this was um, a little bit mistranslated from Mac to PC, but the, uh, this shows um, a little bit of the challenge that we have. So once you have a network like this for a specific organism, this is not the end of the story, it's the beginning of the story. What we would like to do is be able to predict um, what are the fluxes, what are the rates of each of these reactions, and for example, given uh, an environmental condition, nutrients available in the, in the environment, how will this organism grow? What is how there are resources allocated in this network so that the organism can grow and what could be potentially secreted by the, by the organism affecting other species? Now, if you try and do modeling of a whole network of uh, a microbe using standard kinetic modeling, this is a very difficult problem. You'd have to write differential equations for these 1,500 reactions and have a lot of kinetic parameters uh, this traditional michaelis benton parameters for all of these complex reactions uh, that are typically unknown. So this is a very, very difficult problem. And one of the, oops, okay. One of the ways around this, which is uh, what is the method called flux balance analysis, allows us to do models of a whole cell metabolic network in a um, more efficient, less precise, but more efficient and very valuable way, especially as you'll see from the perspective of modeling communities. So this is again the same network, but now instead of thinking of this as a dynamical system, we think of this as a resource allocation problem really, where there are nutrients coming in, the cell needs to produce amino acids, nucleotides, cofactors and so on in a very precise set of proportions shown here, and these proportions are known from experimental measurements, so we know how much of each amino acid is needed to build a new cell. And now you can think of metabolism as this big factory where out of glucose and nitrogen coming in and so on, the cell has to decide how much ATP to produce, how much building blocks to produce, so that 
construction of the biomass can be made in an efficient way. And, and this becomes now a more tractable problem, and I will give you a very quick idea of how this can be done. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, in one, my one slide version of flux balance analysis. Some of you may be familiar with this, for many of you this may be the first time. Uh, I will just, I want to give you a flavor of what this is all about. Um, if we focus here on one individual reaction, one key simplification that makes it possible to model metabolism at this large scale is to take a steady state approximation. So we assume that the, the uh, steady state, that the um, um, amount of each metabolite is, is uh, constant, so the cell is at steady state, not uh, a necessary equilibrium, but a, a dynamical steady state where uh, the, the molecules, the reactions producing this metabolite, in this case glucose 6-phosphate, are balanced exactly by the reactions uh, consuming this metabolite. So there is a net zero flux out of the system. And now what is interesting about this type of approach is that instead of dealing with the concentration of metabolites as a function of time, you deal with the rates of the reaction, the fluxes, and they are uh, related to each other by this simple linear relationship that just imply the conservation of the metabolite or uh, what is called mass balance. So we have l simple linear equations in the fluxes and you have one such equation uh, of conservation for each metabolite in the network. It turns out that this, um, this simplifies the problem mathematically so much that you can really um, uh, use very efficient tools to uh, end up predicting each of these fluxes uh, for a large number of reactions in, in a metabolic network of a, of a microbe. Now, there are additional constraints here. For example, availability of nutrients from the external environment, so you can model the specific environment under which an organism, an organism is grown. For example, how much glucose is available for, from the environment. You can model uh, known irreversibility of certain reactions, and it turns out that all these constraints are linear constraints that allow one to solve this problem through linear optimization, and I'm not going to go into any more detail, but you can, for example, ask what is the set of rates of reactions given the environmental constraints that will allow the cell to grow in the most efficient way, maximizing the rate of production of its biomass. And you can, in a fraction of a second, find both uh, the growth rate of a cell under these conditions and all the reaction rates uh, under these conditions. Yes? A molecular decomposition? Yeah. So, yeah, so here you're not considering the molecular structure except for the stoichiometry. So you do consider the stoichiometry, the specific reactions that take place in E. coli. Um, so in, to some extent, obviously, for each chemical reaction, you conserve atomic composition and so on, but you don't look at, you don't take into account the molecular structure in detail. Uh, oh. In, in the network? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I think I, I can point to some literature people started looking at motifs in metabolism, but I don't, I don't think that's, that, that it's uh, uh, so well studied, partly I think because there are well-known um, pathway structures. So we, yeah, there are a lot of linear pathways that are some typical uh, sets of reactions, but I, I think it's an interesting question. I don't know that anybody has studied, let's say, motifs in the same way as they've been studied for transcriptional networks, for metabolic networks. And yes. Yeah, so there, here you really just study the steady state. You cannot look at the transient. I'll mention a little bit some pseudodynamics shortly and how one can study uh, partially the dynamics of the system as well. That's right. So, why, well, when you do, the, the reason this method is so efficient is because you do the steady state approximation. So you really get rid of the concentrations completely and you study only the steady states and your variables become just the fluxes. There are no more concentrations. Okay. Okay. Um, I won't go into the detail here. Just This is just meant to show that their flux balance has some good aspects to it. It can predict under certain conditions, uh, match 
predi uh, the predictions can match experimental fluxes, but not always. Uh, and it's, it's an ongoing process, so you shouldn't think of flux balance analysis as a perfect tool for predicting microbial metabolism, but as a, a way of predict making hypotheses that are testable. Uh, it has certain advantages, fast computation, it's scalable, there is no need for kinetic parameters, and most importantly, we care about fluxes, we're interested in the rates of reactions, and the cell probably cares about fluxes. So this is why it's important to think about it, uh, fluxes in this way, but it has many limitations. For example, you cannot look at metabolite concentrations, there is no dynamics, you look at population time average, and uh, there are many, still many uh, gene functions that are unknown, which limits our capacity to do whole cell modeling in general. But let me get back to communities and think of how can we use these models of metabolism in single organisms to understand uh, exchange in communities. Um, and so here we have another um, adopted uh, Trieste writer uh, in uh, helping, helping us. So some of you may not know, James Joyce lived for 10 years in Trieste. Uh, and if you walk across one of the channels uh, walking towards the sea, you'll see his statue. Um, and I'm quoting here a sentence, uh, to live, to err, to fall, to triumph, to recreate life out of life, uh, from a portrait of the artist as a young man. Uh, what is interesting about this, it, it kind of hints to synthetic biology, and in fact, this sentence was encoded in Craig Venter's first uh, mycoplasma synthetic genome, uh, and it, it sparked a lot of interesting uh, discussions later on, both because there were some copyright issues, but also at the same time, the copyright issues were, were interestingly um, kind of made irrelevant by evolution because their mutations were quickly changing uh, this sentence. So it's, it's an interesting issue. But for us, what is important here is to mention that in the same way as you can think of synthetic biology as a way of reconstructing and tinkering with microbes, you can also think of a synthetic biology as a way of tinkering with communities and generating communities and understanding their function. So this is an example of work uh, when we need Shu, uh, who is here today and will talk in a few days. Um, and she and collaborators a few years ago created one of the first examples of a syntrophic pairs of organisms. So these are two yeast um, that you were transformed into oxotrophic, were not able each uh, to produce a certain uh, molecule. So they were only able to, pr to grow in uh, presence of each other. So by tinkering the internal network somehow, you could induce a syntrophic interaction and obligate cross-feeding between these two microbes. Um, now, as we were st started thinking of how to use models to uh, study communities, we realized that one interesting twist to this idea was to engineer the environment instead of engineering the microbes. So with a former student in my lab, Niels Klitgord, we thought, how about uh, taking two organisms, two microbes as they are, without changing their internal, ne internal network, but asking whether by providing the right mixture of, of nutrients, we could induce an obligate interaction between the two organisms. So is it possible to engineer the environment so the two organisms are necess uh, have to re rely on each other in order to survive? Um, so the way this is done in flux balance analysis um, is by building multi-compartment models. So you can imagine two organisms being sub-compartments in a larger compartment that is the environment. And now two organisms can exchange nutrients. And as shown in this toy model, um, these organisms, these toy organisms that need A, B, and C as molecules in order to produce biomass, they wouldn't be able to grow uh, on nutrient A unless they're in presence of each other where they can exchange B and C respectively. Now, um, the way this is done in flux balance modeling is by having labels for specific metabolites in each compartment. The details don't matter, but this was the first instance uh, from um, David Stahl's lab of a um, microbial community model based on flux balance analysis. Now, one can use this to ask the following very simple question. If you take two organisms um, and find a set of environments that can support the two organisms together. So you take these two organisms and you ask, what is a set of nutrients, for example, glucose, ammonia, and a sulfur source, and so on and so forth, that will enable the organisms one and two to grow in co-culture? And you could find, it turns out, typically millions of different environments for a number of pairs you can choose. And all of this is computational work. 
And now you can ask, given that these two organisms can grow together in this environment, you can ask whether each organism can grow on its own. And you can have one of these four situations. One possibility is that each organism is also able to grow on a given environment, on a given set of nutrients. In this case, this is kind of a neutral interaction. Uh, but it's possible that uh, on a given environment where the two species can grow, one species is able to grow also on its own, the other cannot. So this would mean that that environment induces a one-directional interaction where one provides an essential molecule to, uh, to two. And uh, the most interesting case perhaps is the case where uh, the two organisms can grow together, but uh, none of them can grow on their own. And in this case, the interaction would be this type of cross-feeding interaction. So one could computationally do this very easily. You can screen many, many different environments and try to find environments that would induce this type of interaction. So what uh, Niels in the lab did a few years ago was building a matrix of this possible interaction between different species. You see here the name of the organism. These are a variety of microbes, uh, partly from um, human-associated, partly environmental-associated. Uh, but what is crucial here is that for each pair of organisms, say E. coli and Salmonella, you can see the pie chart represents the number of metabolites that are uh, the number of environments that could support growth of E. coli and Salmonella together. And the portion of this, the green portion of these uh, environments is the one that would induce um, uh, uh, neutral interaction. That is, this would be a minimal uh, medium that is common to E. coli and Salmonella. And as you could imagine, E. coli and Salmonella being very similar, there are many such environments. But what is most interesting, the yellow portion of this pie chart represents environments that induce an obligate syntrophic interaction between the two organisms. So, um, anytime you see a yellow portion here, this means, for example, B. subtilis, B. subtilis and Salmonella, there are several of the order of hundreds of thousands of environments such that on those environments, the prediction, prediction would be that B. subtilis and Salmonella would need each other in order to survive. So what was striking about this was that par somehow based on the stoichiometry of networks, of metabolic networks across organisms, there seems to be a lot of opportunities for cross-feeding in the microbial world. So there is a lot of uh, possibilities for metabolites that could be secreted by one organism and used by another uh, for growth. Uh, and the question is, does this represent what happens in reality? How to probe this further, uh, both computationally in more detail and experimentally? I'm not keeping tra track of time. Are, are, is someone, are you? I don't know how much. Okay. Um, so I will um, tell you a little bit about how we approach this in a um, more detailed way through another method that is an expansion of flux balance analysis and it's called dynamic flux balance analysis um, and gave rise to what we call COMETS, computation of microbial ecosystem in time and space, which is a way of uh, incorporating genome scale models into a spatial uh, framework to model more realistically microbial metabolism in communities. And this was an effort sparked by uh, Bill Real, a former student in my lab, and I uh, developed them together with Will Harcombe and Chris Marks, who are here, and Pankaj Mehta, who's also here. Uh, um, uh, so this, this, this is still an ongoing process, but it was very exciting to be able to uh, come together with uh, microbiologists to be able to test some of these predictions. But the main concept here I want to highlight is that um, it's possible to make a little bit uh, less assumption. In particular, you don't need to make any assumption about the existence of, a, of an interaction in order to see one emerging from simulations. And the idea is the following. You can uh, model um, in a certain region in space, you can model flux balance for a specific organism as shown before, uh, and you can uh, transform the concentration of metabolites in the medium into an uptake rate, very similar, using something that is basically a michaelis menten equation, so you can determine the rate of uptake of metabolites based on concentrations, and solve at different time steps this flux balance problem, so you can get an in, um, a instantaneous rate of growth for a given organism at a given time and measure the rate of consumption of metabolites. And by iterating this process in different time steps, you can obtain um, an approximation of the growth curve and an approximation of the abundance of metabolites in the medium. So this is still not bypassing the problem of um, 
intracellular metabolite concentration, so you monitor only extracellular metabolite concentration, environmental concentration of metabolites, and the growth of individual species. Um, so nowadays you'll find a lot of people are using these dynamic flux balance methods to model microbial communities because uh, you can imagine modeling a specific organism in a certain region of space, that organism can grow based in, on its own rules, produce a certain metabolite, that metabolite could diffuse away, another organism potentially in the same region or in a different region could detect the presence of that metabolite and use it for growth, um, maximizing its own capacity to, uh, to produce biomass, but there is no a priori assumption of these two organisms having to interact. So if there is an interaction across feeding, this will be the outcome of each organism trying to do what is best for, for itself. Uh, and now by embedding this into a spatial temporal uh, in the spatial temporal uh, setting, you can make models of microbial communities that uh, look a little bit like this. So there, we like to think of these are, as virtual petri dishes where you can inoculate different species, let them grow, and see what happens. And there are a number of applications of this which I'll mention soon. Um, I will just quick, quickly go through uh, some of the validation of this. Uh, will might talk about this more in the next few days, but uh, this is really work that Will Harcom uh, performed uh, uh, testing predictions for a um, uh, mutualistic pair of an E. coli and a salmonella that depend on each other. And again, I imagine you'll hear more for Will on this. Uh, but this was the first test of comets uh, showing that you can really make reasonable predictions of growth for this organism. And I'll skip this. This is an example again from Chris Marks and Will uh, Harcom's uh, work on a three species artificial community, again showing that these models do a reasonable job and actually quite surprisingly good job at predicting the um, uh, abundance of species at different time points given their uh, metabolic network model. Um, so I will just conclude the part on comets just by saying that there are more things to add to this. For example, one can model growth as a convection diffusion problem uh, and make diffusion dependent on the material. So for example, if you're modeling uh, the growth of a colony, diffusion of oxygen through the colony itself will affect the way the colony grows. And this is something that can be taken into account and will have important consequences. So for anybody that is interested, someone already asked me earlier this morning, comments in open, is open source, and I'll be happy to discuss with people uh, throughout the week. Um, so I want to, I'm skipping a few things because I want to get to some um, other final concepts. So one of the key questions, right, we, we, we can use these models to try and understand simple toy communities, but one of the big challenges is whether we can model large natural communities. So this was one first example from uh, prior work um, on trying to model a gut microbiome toy community where you can see each organism represented is it in its own network. But what is interesting here is you can see the emergence of an ecological network whose nodes are the organism themselves and the molecules that are being exchanged between different species. So that would be one of the challenges and interesting questions to ask, can we predict this ecology and the molecular exchange between different microbes in a natural community? And here there is another poet, actually, a, a poet from Tristan that helps us think about this. Uh, this is Umberto Saba, um, whom you'll find next to Corso Italia. This is another beautiful uh, area of Trieste next to the ancient theater, Roman theater. Um, and Saba was a poet, uh, and one of his uh, verses that I borrowed from this has, how beautiful my city must have been back then, a big open market. And I think uh, this is a good way, I think, of thinking about microbial communities as a big open market of molecules, where uh, organisms secrete molecules that can then be used by other molecules. And I think as I'm approaching the time I have, I will just really quickly mention two ways of thinking about this open market. One is a uh, recent work by a postdoc in my lab, Ali Zomorodi, uh, largely inspired by Jeff Gore's work. Um, so one can think of microbes uh, as potentially leaking metabolites, and there, there, there is a lot of interesting work on what has been called the uh, black queen hypothesis of how these exchanges could happen given 
that production of the molecules is often costly. Uh, so one can study uh, the chances of emergence of an interaction given the cost of these metabolites and the fact that producing a certain metabolite will reduce the fitness of the producer to the advantage of a cheater that will give up producing that metabolite because it's available in the environment. And one can study this type of um, dynamics also for pairs of organisms, for example, leakiness of two amino acids in E. coli and try and understand under what conditions uh, the emergence of a mutual cross-feeding could emerge. So what is interesting is that one can use uh, uh, game theory and compute Nash equilibrium for the system to estimate under what conditions, what are the leakiness levels that would support the emergence of, of these communities. So again, I won't have to be able to go into this now, but I'll be happy to chat about this, and I know some of the talks in the next few days will touch upon um, game theory or, or similar uh, concept. Um, the last thing uh, about this open market is I just want to mention quickly something about this possibility that perhaps in these complex communities maybe compartmentalization matters only to some extent. So can we think of communities as soups of enzymes? Does it make sense? Um, so one hint to this is that one can look at the whole metabolic network of across all organisms, and irrespective of who does what function, we can ask, what is the capability of an ecosystem? You can think of the metabolism of the ecosystem as a whole without taking into account what reactions are present in what organism. And one example of how this can be useful uh, is using what is called the network expansion algorithm that was developed by Oliver Ebenhoff and collaborators a few years ago, where the idea is very simple. You can have in this toy network, uh, you can start with a seed of metabolites and ask what molecules are producible by this network. In this case, for example, uh, you can only produce uh, these two final molecules and you're stuck. You cannot do anything more. Um, so this is the scope of the network. If you have this additional metabolite in the seed, you can produce uh, these two reactions. You can take this example to the, to the uh, large network and ask, given a set of initial molecules, for example, environmentally available molecules, what is producible in principle by this network? Um, and this is a very simple algorithm. We actually applied this algorithm to study early life. Recently in my lab, Josh Goldfer, a student in my, in my lab, uh, asked the question of how uh, far can you go in a putative uh, primordial metabolism uh, where phosphate may not be available yet? And this is a very interesting question from the origin of life perspective because phosphate is poorly available in, uh, in, um, and is very difficult to get out of rocks. So the question is how easy it is to obtain uh, or can you obtain any network from this initial molecule? And again, uh, making a long story short, the result of this was that you can obtain a fairly large, unexpectedly large network of metabolites from this initial seed, uh, showing that somehow there is a phosphate-independent subnetwork hidden in current metabolism, which has, again, implication for early metabolism, but also potential implication for natural communities nowadays. In fact, we know that many communities uh, can use uh, sulfolipids instead of phospholipids under phosphorus-limited conditions. And I will stop here. Um, and just actually with this last thought, that this idea of a soup of enzymes as a way of modeling communities has two, I think, temptations. So there is the temptation that is practical, given that we have a lot of metagenomic sequencing data, can we use this data directly uh, to model uh, metabolism in communities without going through the construction of individual organisms. And the other, more interesting perhaps, is an intellectual temptation, and that is the question of whether really uh, you know, does, does it or doesn't it matter um, that enzymes are enclosed in specific uh, organisms or could you think really as the main driving force of ecosystem metabolism as really a collective phenomenon of just reactions together without uh, taking into account where they belong to? And I, you know, in my thinking, I go back and forth between thinking that yes, compartmentalization matter or no, maybe not, but I think this is an interesting topic for future discussion. And I will stop here and uh, thank my students and postdocs and collaborators and funding sources and all of you for listening.